this panel is called Moving Toward Weight Loss Equity. Um, and as you heard, uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of gaps in coverage, and some of the people who need these drugs the most are not able to get them. Um, and now that we've got this better understanding of its effects on cardiovascular disease and everything, type 2 diabetes, and on and on and on, um, access to this drug is more important than ever. And the next panel will delve into that um, access, particularly through Medicaid and Medicare. So please welcome to the stage Chris Harris, Senior Vice President of Client Strategy and Health, at, uh, so, sorry, Client Strategy for Health at Stella Rising, Michael Kolber, partner at Manet, Phelps, and Phillips, and Derek Assay, Senior Vice President of Government Strategy and Federal Accounts at Eli Lilly and Company. The moderator for the panel will be someone who you may recognize from his freakishly huge head floating through your TikTok. Uh, account every morning. It's Jack O'Brien, my colleague, digital editor at mm and &M. Thank you all for being here today and braving this monsoon that we've had in April. Obviously not the way we drew it up, but it's a nice day to be indoors. That's kind of how I look at it. I am Jack O'Brien. I'm the digital editor at mm and &M, and I'm pleased to be joined by an esteemed panel here, really picking up on a lot of the themes that we heard about in that first session, and the one that we're really going to focus on among all of the different things that we've seen coming through in the obesity treatment dynamic is the payer access side of the conversation. And Derek, I wanted to bring you in first because we have a preview podcast, um, which you can go download on wherever you get your podcasts, about this panel and about this event. And we talked a lot about the payer conversation. They alluded to it at the end of the previous panel, but I wanted to bring you in in terms of where we really see the payer dynamics right now as it relates to the obesity market. Obviously, we just had the news that came out of CMS a couple weeks ago. Where do we stand? Yeah, I think it's improving dramatically. And I think our, our colleagues from Novo shared some of this, that you know, we're really seeing a sea change in how people and payers particularly view the treatment of obesity, which is a chronic disease. And so if you look today, I think about 20 uh, Medicaid agencies around the country are now covering obesity medications and about 20 of the state health employee plans are also covering. Uh, I think many people are aware the, the uh, Office of Personnel Management covers for federal government employees and uh, Veterans Affairs covers as well. Um, Jack mentioned the, the CMS announcement uh, from a couple weeks ago. We were very pleased with how quickly they moved on the additional indication. Clearly, there's much more work to be done uh, to, to have broader obesity coverage uh, for those patients that don't have those additional um, comorbid conditions. So I think we're very encouraged. And then lastly, on the employer side, we're continuing to see additional opt-in for broader coverage. So we're, we're pleased with the direction and the trajectory. A lot of different threads that we're going to be able to pull on throughout this conversation. I forgot to mention before we got going that if you want to ask any questions, we do have the Slido deck. I have our precious iPad up here that can answer any and all questions. So feel free to send those in as we go. Michael, I want to bring you into the conversation as well in terms of what you're seeing in the payer dynamics in the OBC space, kind of what Derek was alluding to there. Sure. Um, so I, I, not clear from my uh, title, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, a regulatory healthcare regulatory expert and, and policy advocate. Um, and so why are we you know, talking about what CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, said a few weeks ago. Why is that so important? Um, because as, as the last panel alluded to, uh, since the Medicare Part D program was created uh, 20 years ago and uh, Medicaid even more distantly than that, uh, both programs have excluded from uh, or permitted the exclusion from coverage for drugs for weight loss or weight gain or anorexia. Um, and C CMS, which, which runs the Medicare Part D program, uh, has consistently interpreted that to exclude coverage uh, for drugs for, for obesity. Um, and uh, I, I wrote a white paper last year with uh, the Obesity Action Coalition and the Obesity S Society uh, that was funded by Pfizer uh, to walk through some of the legal and policy reasons why CMS shouldn't continue to interpret the statutory exclusion that way. Uh, and prime among them is that treating obesity is not the same thing as using a drug for weight loss, that obesity is, is in 
you know, widely recognized within the medical community, within gov other government regulators, um, as a disease of, it, of its own nature that, you know, has an impact on weight and has other impacts, other causes as well. Uh, and so we argued in that white paper, and we have argued to CMS, and we talked to the FDA about it, um, that CMS should, you know, as, uh, you know, OPM, other agencies have, recognize that obesity is a disease and uh, covering AOMs is covering uh, drugs for the treatment of the disease of obesity, not solely a, a drug for weight loss or, or weight gain or anorexia. Um, CMS, you know, has continued to reject that position. Um, and so what, what changed a few weeks ago, um, you know, we heard um, that uh, FDA expanded uh, the label for, for Wigovi. So it's now uh, indicated on the label for uh, treatment, for, for prevention of cardiovascular disease risk uh, in people with established cardiovascular disease uh, who have obesity. Um, and CMS said, uh, fine, that's not uh, using the drug for weight loss or weight gain, and so it's not excluded from the Part D program, so plans can cover it, um, which is the guidance that they put out um, at the end of March. Um, and since then, um, we've seen, uh, there was a Wall Street Journal article, I think, last week, um, that uh, essentially several, if not all, of the major Part D uh, plans have said they will begin covering it even this year, uh, covering drugs that are are indicated for uh, prevention of cardiovascular risk. Um, and so it's, it's really a, a dramatic uh, improvement from where we were even a few weeks ago um, and, and very encouraging. I, 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 personally, I, I do think that CMS can and should go further um, because there's, there's still obviously stigma uh, associated with saying that these major government payers are not covering uh, these FDA-approved drugs for their, you know, their first indication, which was for, for weight management. Um, and, um, uh, you know, when they are really being prescribed for people who, who have the d d disease of obesity and for whom it's a medically accepted indication. So um, there's a lot, a lot to be optimistic about, um, but, um, you know, still more work to be done. Absolutely, and I want to bring Chris into the conversation here as it relates to, we've, we've talked a lot about obviously how drug makers are looking at the situation, how it's been marketed towards HCPs and consumers. You do a lot in terms of consumer uh, sentiment, and I want to bring you in because that's such a key aspect to the stigmatization argument, to the can I actually you know, check with my coverage and get access to these drugs? What have you been seeing on your end? Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, we, we have a consumer panel and we do a, an annual uh, study on, on health and wellness. And in our most recent one, we asked a lot about weight management and what people are doing and where they are in that process. And we, act, we asked about GLP-1 uh, drugs and medications and access to those, et cetera. And I think there are a few things that we're seeing that I think help drive this conversation along really from a consumer standpoint. The first is just where people are getting their information, just thinking about consumers, putting that mindset on. And I think we heard Anne and Christine say some of this in the previous panel. Uh, the good news is two-thirds of people, their first choice is they're going to their physician to, or to a healthcare provider for information on well, uh, weight loss, weight management, and um, medicines that they can actually take. There's also a great sense of hopefulness, and I think that also came up um, in that previous panel. There's a lot of conversation out there, so people are very hopeful about this. When you talk about these weight loss drugs, four out of 10 people are saying, yeah, they're interested in, they would be interested in learning more about it and, and trying, if they worked with their physician, to get access to it. Um, at the same time, that hopefulness is, is sort of balanced with confusion and some concern. And I think, um, as Michael was just saying, you just listen to that in terms of what is covered and how what my plan is going to cover me for. And people are expressing concern and questions around that. It's not very clear to a lot of people. And so we hear the same number of people balanced while they're interested in trying these drugs or looking into them, the same number of people are not. So you say, and then why? Well, concerns about side effects, concerns about long-term effects, cost, and insurance coverage are 
key drive key uh, points that kind of rise to the top. And I think um, when you think about those elements that are going to potentially hold people back, it's a real concern. And I think the other thing is, and it came up in a different context in the previous panel, is that notion of trust. And when you think about those sources of information and people are going to their physician for information, friends and family and social media is really prominent in that as well as sources of information. And there's a lot of talk in the media in general and in social media and on the internet about this very topic. And the challenge there is there's potential for a lot of misinformation, disinformation, greater confusion. There is a lot of buzz in the, in, in the space. So what we saw and we asked people their trust in medical developments, pharmaceutical, new medical, pharmaceutical options in this space. And there's a big number of people are actually expressing um, some level of distrust. And that's a concern. I think that's one main thing as we think about communications, confusion and clarity, knowing that there's a, an element of trust that we have to gain with the consumer. And I want to bring you back into the conversation, Derek, because I think that's such an interesting point where it's obviously there is so much demand. We've seen that both from Eli Lilly's side and from Novo's side has released their GLP-1 drugs. But there is that level of confusion. There is that, you know, you have to go talk and see what your coverage looks like. From Eli Lilly's end, you know, what does the path forward look like as it relates to being able to clarify these insurance angles for the consumer? What What is Eli's take on that? Yeah, I think, well... We have a lot of patient assistance programs that help with that, mm -hmm. um, particularly for the commercially insured. So for commercially insured patients, I think uh, patients can pay as low as $25 for a one or three month supply for, that are for covered patients. For uncovered patients, it would be about half price, so about 550 So there are a number of plans uh, for that. I think um, for federal health care programs, th those programs do not apply, um, uh, just given the restrictions in that space. But I think we do everything we can to help facilitate the patient uh, knowledge in that space. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, recently launched is Lloyd Direct. Uh, yeah. And one of the reasons we did that was not to replace physicians or replace pharmacies, but to try to make it a little easier for patients. Not only if, if they don't have a physician or can't get in to see their physician, can we connect them with an independent um, physician who would make an independent choice for that patient, whether that includes uh, therapy or not. Um, and then on the pharmacy side, to, to have the option of a mail order pharmacy. I think it does a couple of things. Uh, in that space, what we do is automatically apply the, uh, the copay cards uh, with those pharmacies, so it makes it a little easier for the patients that qualify. And then lastly, um, and not that this is a huge problem with uh, well-known pharmacies, but uh, just to make sure the patient knows, hey, this is the Lilly drug, it's not a, a counterfeit, et cetera, if it's coming from, from Lilly Direct. If I could quickly build on one point that, that Michael made around uh, CMS, and again, we're very encouraged by that. The one thing I think has changed in the last 20 years is that medical societies have changed how they view uh, the treatment of obesity. You know, it's really seen as a complex chronic disease, which when CMS interpreted their policy 20 years ago when the Medicare Modernization Act was put into place, that was not the case. So there's been a really big sea change in terms of how the clinicians, patient advocacy, uh, other folks have viewed uh, the treatment of obesity, and that's why we agree with Michael's paper that CMS could take a relook at that and interpret it a little bit differently. And I know we talked about this on the podcast and you were able to give a, a clear answer because you don't have a crystal ball, but what does the go forward look like from Lily's perspective in terms of what CMS could do in terms of any sort of changes? Obviously, we're in a contentious election year. You know, a lot of commercial insurers are looking to CMS kind of for like a, you know, where should we be going? Where's the domino going to fall? What does that mean for you as a drug maker? You know, I think we continue to build uh, those arguments that they can cover. I think the thing that is helpful with the addition of the new indication for you know, our competitor product is that it builds what I would call this wall of evidence. You know, that you know, we talk about obesity being kind of the basis, or there's, there's 200 uh, health-related conditions that emanate from obesity or related to obesity. And I think when you see the additional indications added, and I know we're studying a number of those, uh, it helps given that reason to believe that, hey, there's a lot more to the story than just weight loss here. This is really about treating a very complex disease. So I think as we continue to build that evidence, um, it makes the story stronger for both. And I think there's two paths here. There's the CMS path, and there is a, uh, 
a draft piece of legislation out there that's been out for many years, um, uh, a bill called the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, that uh, I think could be a, a second and an optional path to, you know, whether it's the regulatory path or the legislative path to, to expand coverage in the Medicare space. But you, you hit the nail on the head, Jack. I think as, you know, so many payers look to what CMS is doing, and if CMS broadens coverage for obesity patients, we think that would further expand where we're at in, in the commercial employer market. Um, just to pick up on a couple of things Eric said, um, I, I, I thought it was really interesting how quickly the Part D payers following the CMS guidance said that they were going to cover, um, you know, essentially Wagovi um, for this indication. Um, they certainly, you know, could have said, we're continuing to study it, we're going to wait until CMS updates its systems, maybe wait until the next plan year in 2025. Um, and I think what that reflects is that. I, to your point, this is not sort of an all or, or, or nothing thing. There's going to be, you know, particular indications where they're going to cover. They're going to continue. The plans are going to continue to use the tools they have to manage utilization, um, and you know, which you know, I think probably from the industry's perspective, while not welcome, given supply challenges and other things, we recognize it's it's going to happen over time. Uh, and so I think, you know, a, a point that, you know, people who aren't like in this Part D world all the time, you know, just need to keep in mind is that it's not a switch that gets turned on all, o overnight, that the prescribers are going to be prescribing for particular indications. There's going to be back and forth with the payers. Uh, and, you know, some of those scripts are going to get covered. Others aren't. They're going to try to redirect patients to other, you know, forms of treatment. Um, but this just, um, you know, the, the CMS guidance and this change now really just sort of opens up the door uh, to having those conversations, which I, I think is, is, is really important and a big advance. Um, and then the other thing it does is, is on the point you raised on, on TROA, that there is a bill in Congress that's been around for, for many years, has been viewed as just hugely expensive uh, to, to for Congress to pass um, to to just change the statutory exclusion that we're talking about to eliminate it from the statute entirely um, but now because of uh, the changing CMS guidance, I think the expectation is that that, that bill becomes a lot less expensive uh, because a lot of um, a lot of patients are going to be able to get access to the drugs. And so the, the population that, you know, doesn't have cardiovascular disease, doesn't have diabetes, and is taking the drug solely for obesity um, becomes a smaller percentage of, of, of the market share. And, and therefore, from the Congressional Budget Office perspective, not as expensive if, if Congress were to change the statute. So takes a lot for something to be too expensive for Congress these days, I'll say that. Chris, I want to bring you in here in terms of what, you know, these changes, Michael's language was that it was a dramatic change in terms of how CMS looks at these drugs. What is the expectation in terms of what that can mean for consumer sentiment, which is, like you said, already so intrigued in one regard by these drugs, but also, you know, confused in terms of how to get access to them, afford them, all this sort of stuff. What is the expectation for the go forward, you know, based on this change? You know, I think from a consumer standpoint, we do have to recognize that there is uh, a very low baseline in terms of people's engagement in this space when it's a need, when it's a true need. Otherwise, the awareness of it is extremely low. We ask people, so tell us more about your sense around cost and insurance coverage on this. Half the people had zero opinion. These are people who are in the category. Right? People who are um, have expressing they have a weight loss issue, they're looking to lose weight, they're considering these, these drugs, they're interested in coverage, but they don't even know where to start. They don't know what the right questions are to ask. There's a, and back to the point of where people are getting their information, perception is reality to people. So as people... Just, just in just the general media, pop culture, etc., those are sources of information for people, and we have to recognize that, and we have to continue to combat that with real information, easy to acquire, easier, easy to consume content and information for people to help knock down some of these, these kind of walls around their awareness and their perception. So their perception is, hopefully, I'm going to have coverage, but I really don't know at this point. 
I want to just remind our audience that we have about 10 minutes left here in this panel. If you have any questions, feel free to send them in from uh, the Q&A deck on Slido. We've had a few questions come in, so I want to get those and also spur a few others in case anyone in the audience has them. This one is for Derek. It's, how do you see Lilly direct impact in the obesity treatment landscape for patient access? I think you kind of alluded to it earlier. Well, I think the biggest thing, and I did touch on this a little bit, is I think it helps connect some of those dots that Chris was talking about. So, um, you know, helping understand, and what we've said, well, there's two providers now. So we have uh, Tru TruePill and Amazon we added about a month ago. And, you know, the choice between those two, we have a pharmacy solutions hub that will determine where, you know, which one may be in network with the, the uh, consumer's health uh, plan and so forth and trying to find that right match there. And so it does match up that health coverage and then automatically applies any uh, copay cost savings. So it helps tremendously in, in that way. Obviously, we have much more work to do to continue that positive momentum that we have ensuring that uh, employers are, are opting into obesity coverage with their, with their health plan and their PBM and so forth. But that's where I think it can play a key role in helping just to make that process a little smoother for patients. And I wanted to pull on that last thread that you brought up there about the employers. We talked about this on the podcast, but I wanted to bring it up to the entire panel too, is what is the employer aspect in this dynamic? Because there's obviously, you know, consumers saying, hey, I want access to that, but it's dependent on my coverage. A lot of people get their coverage through their employer-based plans. Where, where have employers been in terms of like communicating, hey, we want to be able to have this covered because there was the JP Morgan analysis that came out about a month ago saying that if there's widespread use of GLP-1 drugs, we could see a 1% increase in GDP. That's not not nothing nowadays. So where do employers fit into all of this? Yeah, what I would say, I think we're seeing growing uh, adoption by employers. The one thing that's been frustrating for me, and even on my train ride in from New Jersey this morning, um, I saw an article on one employer, the well-known national story, that uh, decided to, to uh, remove coverage for obesity medications. The only thing I see talked about is the cost of the drugs. No, you know, they're not talking about how much we're spending on obesity care. So the Senate Joint Economic Committee um, said in 23 alone, we're going to spend $520 billion on obesity-related health care costs, direct health care costs in this country. Not, you know, not beyond, you know, think about the societal benefits and, and costs that come with that. So, yeah, I think we need to tell the whole picture there, um, and and so I think it's it's frustrating when we just look at just what the cost of medication is, and and we all know, and I think you all in this room are very familiar that list price in the United States is not representative of what the actual drug cost is. You know, there's a lot of you know there's negotiations with payers, there's a lot of government uh, pricing programs that provide discounts and so forth, and I think we really need to look at the at the true cost of what what the medications are because it's it's much different, and I, and I think the employers that are that are doing that. Um, and look at the true value, uh, many of them are opting into coverage. Chris or Michael, I didn't know if there's anything you want to add onto the point about where employers fit into this whole situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the point on you know, developing the economic case uh, for coverage of these drugs is, is really important that, you know, the, the costs of them are very, you know, clear and distinct and the, the benefits, are, you know, the economic benefits are somewhat more diffuse. Um, and, you know, two points on that, it, just in terms of the lack of data, um, the Congressional Budget Office has sort of said that currently they, they, they give no credit to these drugs in reducing costs at all um, because they, they haven't found any studies that, that actually document that, but they're, they're looking for such studies. But on the other side of the equation, they, you know, we've spoken to like venture capital firms who are you know, making healthcare investments and are so concerned that GLP-1s are so effective that you know, they're, they're less interested in investing in other you know, obesity or weight loss related indications because they just think they're going to so swamp uh, other areas of healthcare, which, you know, seems like a great, you know, it's such a large problem. It's hard to imagine that this, this one class of drugs is going to just, you know, be so disruptive that it's not worth investing in those areas anymore. But there's just, you know, it, it just, I think, reflects the lack of, of good data about really what, you know, the economic consequences are going to be um, from these drugs. And I think that's going to be helpful uh, to, to employers because employers today are, you know, are just seeing the costs and they're, they, they're, they're struggling to find good data on, on the benefits. We had another Q&A question come in. I'm going to direct this one over to Derek, but you guys can feel free to hop in as well. What are your thoughts on the IRA and Part D redesign, and how will that impact the obesity market over the next few years? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, so redesign goes into effect uh, next year, so 2025. I think it'll be a huge benefit for patients in that there'll no longer be a donut hole, um, hard out-of-pocket cap at, at $2,000, and what, what we call smoothing, I think Medicare calls it the Medicare prescription payment plan, so patients can smooth out their cost sharing over the year. Um, we think that can be a tremendous benefit for patients. Obviously, it does put more pressure on the health plans, because the health plans previously in today's design have 15% um, of the cost and catastrophic, they'll have about 60% of the cost going forward. So there's gonna be more pressure for them under this, but, um, but I think I think, you know, I think if you, you can demonstrate the value, Michael talked a, a little bit about that. Um, you know, I think we have a really good shot with uh, keeping broad access for the GLPs. Um, I think broadly, and they're covered today in the plans, and we would expect them to be covered in 2025 and beyond. Michael, is there anything you want to bring up on that point? I think you cover it. All right. <laughs> Chris, I want to bring you into the conversation here as it relates to, you know, that we're at this moment in time and we've seen obviously the the go forward looks, you know, very promising in terms of being able to see wider access. Want to talk a little bit about the equity side of the equation too, because that's the other side of this panel. Is where it, where in terms of consumer sentiment is that focus on equity? I think there's a lot of focus in terms of like if I can get my access to this drug, but there are all these different diverse patient populations, people that have insurance coverage, the people that don't. Where does equity fit into this whole conversation as well? Yeah. So I, I think from. I, I, Listen, I think equity and access to care, access to these medicines, medications, um, is, is center, equity is center to all of it. Um, and as we think about and as we actually looked at, um, people's connection um, to where they're getting information and sources for information is, um, is critical to that. And actually how we, somebody was talking about targeting a little earlier, Targeting is key, but also just patient, patient support systems and patient assistant, and you just, you just mentioned that, Derek, are key from an, equi from an equity standpoint so that we can actually reach people in the right channels, have them engage, support them with the right types of content, uh, help them navigate. People don't understand that there are resources available to them. So when I said perception is reality, Perception is costs are extremely expensive. There are stigmas associated with this. So how can the pharmaceutical companies help to kind of knock down some of those perceptions? So I think that's a, one of the key things that emerge from an equity standpoint. I just wanted to add an important equity point here is that, you know, there, there are 90 million people who have Medicaid uh, coverage in the, in, in the country, you know, low income and disabled people. Um, and um, the change that we've been talking about in Medicare has a one-for-one -one correspondence in Medicaid, so that state Medicaid programs will now have to cover GLP ones when they're, you know, um, being prescribed for people with with uh, cardiovascular risk who have established cardiovascular disease. So um, I, I think that's an incredibly important point, and actually, it's it's mandatory in Medicaid that Medicaid programs cover all drugs, you know, unless they're excluded. So while we were talking about this negotiation with payers in Part D, um, that really shouldn't exist in Medicaid, and it's going to be a, a really important part of the picture in, in improving uh, health equity that there will now be this access. Derek, I'm going to give you the final word on this because we're heading into the final half <laughs> half a minute here. Um, I mean, I think it's key, and I think one of the, the, the important things is, is we continue to uh, educate and, and um, build out programs like Lilly Direct and other things. I think it's... In, yeah, it's important on the equity piece. The, the one thing we've done, and we put an, an open letter on uh, Lilly.com, is to, to make it clear that you know these drugs are for patients that have a serious chronic disease called obesity, not for cosmetic use. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do to really reinforce equity, uh, is to make sure that the right patients can have access to these. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you all being off to offer your insights here and, again, braving the rain. Thank our panelists for their wonderful insights. Thank you.